Hello and welcome to Indus News from Islamabad. I am Anib Hamid and these are the headlines. Azerbaijan's Defense Ministry says seven people have been killed and 33 others wounded in Armenian bombing in Gaja City. The latest rise comes a day after a Russian brokered ceasefire took hold over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. An array of Iraqi militia groups have agreed to a suspend rocket attacks on U.S. targets. A spokesman for one of the groups said the decision was made to give Baghdad time to plan for a withdrawal of the U.S. troops. But he warned that the attacks would continue if U.S. forces remain indefinitely. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says India is trying to destabilize Pakistan by provoking sectarianism in the country. In a tweet, Khan said New Delhi has been working for the past three months to incite Shia-Sunni conflict by the targeted killing of religious scholars. He said Pakistan's security agencies have foiled multiple attempts in this regard. India has become the second country after the U.S. to top 7 million COVID-19 cases with almost 75,000 new infections. The Indian Health Ministry has reported 918 deaths overnight, taking toll to 108,000. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported 12 deaths in a day, raising the count to 6,570. Globally, the virus has infected over 37 million people and claimed more than 1,071,000 lives. In Belarus, thousands of protesters took to the streets in Minsk for yet another week, calling for President Alexander Lukashenko to step down. Security forces detained some 50 demonstrators after clashes with police. Belarus has been rocked by mass protests since August's presidential election that the opposition says was rigged. News in detail coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back now. Let's have the news in detail. The Azri Defense Ministry says seven civilians have been killed and 33 others injured in Armenian bombing in the Ganja city. The latest ranks comes a day after a Russian brokered ceasefire took hold over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. Azerbaijan has accused Armenia of importing Russian missiles on passenger aircraft under the garb of humanitarian aid. Azri head of foreign policy affairs Hikmet Hajiyev said Armenia used these missiles to attack civilians in the Mingashevir city. The warring sides continue to accuse each other of violating the terms of the ceasefire. Earlier, Pakistan welcomed the ceasefire between the both countries. In a statement, the foreign office said Armenia must withdraw its forces from Azerbaijan's territory for sustainable peace. More than 400 people have died and thousands displaced since the fighting started nearly two weeks ago. Now, an array of Iraqi militia groups have agreed to suspend rocket attacks on U.S. targets. In an interview, a spokesman said the attacks are being halted to give Baghdad time to plan for a withdrawal of U.S. troops. But he warned that the attacks would continue if U.S. forces remain indefinitely. He said the government must implement a parliamentary resolution that calls for the withdrawal of foreign troops. Between October 2019 and July this year, nearly 40 rocket attacks targeted American interests in Iraq. The frequency of the rocket fire has strained Iraq-U.S. relations, prompting the U.S. to threaten to close its mission in Baghdad. Now, Prime Minister Imran Khan says India is trying to destabilize Pakistan by triggering sectarian conflict in the country. In a tweet, Khan said New Delhi has been working for three months to incite Shia-Sunni conflict by target killing of religious scholars. He said Pakistan's security agencies have foiled multiple attempts in this regard. He urged religious leaders not to fall into Indian trap by blaming each other for these killings. 
The Prime Minister condemned the murder of a prominent religious scholar, Adil Farooqi, in Karachi yesterday. He assured the security agencies of Pakistan will nab the culprits responsible for the target killing. Meanwhile, Indian troops have martyred four more civilians in occupied Kashmir, Kulgam and Pulwama districts. The troops martyred two youth during cordon air search operations in the Chingam area of the Kulgam district, while the two others were targeted in Dadura area of the Pulwama district. The military operation in Dadura was going on till the last reports came in. Earlier, another 14-year-old boy was shot injured by unidentified gunmen in the Pulwama district. The occupied valley is under India's crushing curfew and communications blackout for the past 433 days. Now, India has become the second country after the United States to top 7 million COVID-19 cases with almost 75,000 new infections. The Indian Health Ministry has reported 918 deaths overnight, taking the toll to over 108,000. While globally, the virus has infected over 37 million people and claimed more than a million and 71,000 lives. Details in this report. The second wave of COVID-19 is now tumbling records and enforcing fresh restrictions amid the global dash for a WHO-approved vaccine. The outbreaks continue to remain aggressive in India, Brazil and the U.S. White House Dr. Sean Conley says U.S. President Donald Trump is no longer a COVID-19 transmission risk. Trump has also decided to continue public rallies without categorically being tested negative for the virus. The Democratic nominee Joe Biden has asked the president not to violate COVID-19 protocols and set a bad precedent for his followers. Make sure two things. One, that he is clear. He is not a spreader like his... Like Dr. Fauci said, the super spreader event he had for the Supreme Court announcement. And secondly, I think it's important that he make it clear to all the people that they should be socially distanced, they should be on the lawn, that's fine. But in fact, they should be socially distanced and wearing masks. The surge of the second wave through Europe is now causing record high daily spikes in France and worryingly high cases in the UK. The once worst hit Spain is again fearing a dangerous outbreak as cases in the country spike. While desperate businesses oppose the reimposition of Madrid lockdown, Spain's Prime Minister says it was necessary. We have always put above any other consideration the public health to save lives. We ask all governments to do the same to think of the sick health professionals who face the COVID again in hospitals and primary care centers, to think also of the victims and their families and to be aware that we have to give a clear, forceful response to the evolution of the pandemic in certain territories. Over in Asia, India has registered another 918 deaths in the last 24 hours, taking the toll to over 108,000, with cases tally exceeding 7 million. Meanwhile, China has reported 21 new cases of the novel coronavirus, up from 15 the previous day. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 12 more people have lost their lives to COVID-19 overnight, raising the death toll to 6,570. The health ministry says 666 people tested positive in the last 24 hours. The ministry says there are 8,904 active COVID-19 cases in the country. It said out of nearly 319,000 countrywide cases, more than 303,000 have recovered so far. The ministry said Southern Province of Sindh leads in the cases tally with over 140,000 infections. Meanwhile, the health ministry has imposed a mini smart lockdown in certain areas of the capital city. It says teams are conducting sampling in those areas of Islamabad for potential quarantine to curb transmission of the virus. Moving on now, China says all concerned parties on Iran's nuclear issue should join a regional multilateral dialogue to implement the 2015 UN resolution. In a meeting with his Iranian counterpart Javad Zarif in the Chinese city of Tengchong, Wang said Beijing will continue to promote implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. Zarif said Iran fully affirms China's role in safeguarding the JCPOA. He says Iran is willing to work with China, Russia and the European Union. Zarif said the Iran welcomes Beijing's initiatives on the regional platform. The Iranian foreign minister said he hopes relevant parties will jointly maintain regional peace and stability. 
Meanwhile, tens of thousands of Israelis have again taken to the streets calling for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's resignation. The Black Flags movement that called for protesters, demonstrations were held at 1,200 locations across the country. Israeli has defied a ban on gathering to protest against the Prime Minister for 16th straight week. Demonstrators say Netanyahu is unfit to rule amid corruption indictment and for mishandling COVID-19 pandemic. Police clashed with the protesters in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Last week, the government's tourism minister resigned over the failure to contain the coronavirus outbreak. Netanyahu is on trial for bribery, fraud and breach of trust. Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has met World Jewish Congress President Ronald Lauder in West Bank. A Palestinian minister said the meeting came after a call by Lauder for Palestinians to revive peace talks with Israel. In a statement, the Congress said Lauder met Abbas for a private visit to discuss a range of issues in the Middle East. Lauder said he hopes the accords of normalization of ties with Tel Aviv will bring the Palestinians and Israeli back to peace talks. Lauder attended the September 15 White House ceremony of the government signing between Israel, the UAE and Bahrain. Moving on, Yemen collision says it has destroyed an explosive-laden drone fired by Houthis towards Saudi Arabia city of Najran. The Saudi state media said rebels continue to systematically target civilians. The Houthi group is yet to comment on the claim, but it regularly fires drones towards Saudi areas. The collision also intercepted a Houthi drone aiming at the Saudi region. Earlier this week, the collision destroyed a Houthi boat bomb in the Red Sea. It also captured a strategic base in Yemen from the rebels. Now eight people have died due to an explosion at a gas station in a suburb of Nigeria city of Lagos. Deputy Governor of Lagos State, Obafemi Hamzad, says those found liable will be prosecuted. Lagos State Emergency Management Agency had said the blast affected a number of buildings, including a school. Authorities have sealed the school until investigations into the incident are concluded. We recovered five bodies. 25 buildings were affected. Out of the 25 buildings that were affected, 10 were severely affected. Three vehicles are involved. 16 shops were involved. Well, in a statement, Emergency Management Agency said the exact cause of the explosion is still unknown. Now, another three people have been killed and six injured after an explosion by gas leakage in Iran's Khorasan province. Ahvaz Municipality Fire and Safety Services had said six others are injured as the blast flattened a residential building. The state media says rescue teams are looking for survivors in the rubble. There has been a number of explosion incidents due to gas leakage in Iran. Earlier, 19 people died in a gas blast at a medical facility in Tehran. Now moving to Tajikistan, where people are voting in the country's presidential election. Opposition Social Democratic Party has boycotted the polls over laws, it says, ensure re-election of President Imamali Rahmon. Constitutional changes passed in 2016 allowed Rahmon to run for office unlimited number of times. All four competitors are viewed as token opponents and have avoided criticizing Rahmon. Russian allied Rahmon has been running the Tajik nation of 9.5 million people since 1992. He is expected to win the election for next seven-year term as well. More news coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, in New Zealand, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says her successful response to COVID-19 helped prevent devastating effects on the economy. Speaking at a campaign rally six days ahead of the country's election on October 17th, Ardern said her administration's strategy helped open New Zealand's economy faster than others. Early poll show Ardern's Labour Party is expected to win the election with a wide lead over the Conservative National Party. The Prime Minister is running for re-election, promising to boost infrastructure, spending, tackling chronic housing shortage and renewable electricity. Now, Lithuania is holding its parliamentary elections today amid the coronavirus pandemic. Election officials have asked the voters to mark ballots with their own pens to avoid the transmission of the virus. The elections are being seen as a vote of confidence on Prime Minister Solius' handling of the COVID-19 crisis. 
The centrist Farmers and Green Party, which leads the ruling coalition, is neck and neck in opinion polls with the centre-right Homeland Union. Lithuania's hybrid election system will elect half of the 141 members of parliament today in a proportional vote. The remaining lawmakers will be elected in their constituencies with a runoff vote for the top two candidates on 25th of October. Now in Belarus, thousands of demonstrators through the streets in Minsk for yet another week calling for President Alexander Lukashenko to step down. Security forces detained some 50 protesters after clashes with police in the capital. On Saturday, Lukashenko went to a jail in Minsk to meet detained opposition leaders. State media reported that the president called the meeting to discuss constitutional reforms with his imprisoned opponents. Belarus has been rocked by mass protests since August presidential election that the opposition says was rigged by Lukashenko. The European Union and the United States have refused to recognize Lukashenko's new term. Now, in the U.S. state of Colorado, one person has been killed during clashes between Black Lives Matter protesters and a pro-police rally. Police say the shooter was a private security guard who has been arrested. A private news channel said the arrested security guard was hired to provide protection to its crew. Denver police say it's now investigating the incident as a homicide. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has shown her support to U.S. presidential candidate Joe Biden for the upcoming election. In a tweet, Thunberg urged the U.S. voters to make their voices heard in the presidential election, saying the polls are beyond politics. Thunberg sparked a global climate protest movement after striking outside the Swedish parliament in 2018. In 2019, President Donald Trump mocked Thunberg in a tweet, saying she needed to work on her anger management problem. Thunberg and her Fridays for Future movement was nominated for this year's Nobel Peace Prize as well. well. Now at least 20 passengers have died and 30 others are injured after a bus collided with a train in Thailand. Police said some 60 passengers were on their way to a temple in the Cha Cho Ing Sao province to mark the and for Buddhist event. Rescue workers said the bus overturned and its stop was ripped off after the accident. They said rescue efforts are ongoing and they need a crane to lift the bus. Officials said the number of casualties is expected to rise. A 2018 report by World Health Organization says Thailand has the second highest traffic fatality rate in the world. Also, five people have been killed in a mid-air collision between a tourist plane and a micro-light trailing aircraft in western France. In a statement, local government officials said a microlight aircraft carrying two people collided with a DA-40 tourist plane with three people on board. The official said microlight landed safely without harming anyone else, while DA-40 landed several meters away, killing all five people. Meanwhile, prosecutor Gregor Dulin said the number of deaths is not still confirmed. Well, three people have died also in forest fires in Syria now. The health ministry says at least 70 people have been taken to hospital for breathing difficulties. State media says the fires have also burned swathes of land in neighboring Lebanon since Thursday. It said hundreds of hectares have been burned in Syria's Latakia, Tartus and central Homs provinces. It said firefighters are working to extinguish the blaze. The Latakia Fire Brigade said they are facing the largest series of fires seen in the province in years. Now, South Sudan's worst flooding in three decades has forced an estimated 368,000 people to flee their homes since July. The disaster has added insult to injuries of Sudanese who have not yet recovered from the civil war. More about the miseries in the sports. The UN says roughly half of South Sudan's 78 counties have large swathes of land underwater. By the time flood water started rising, ethnic violence had already forced Vorgal Polo, her husband and their seven children to flee their home twice this year. Near the remote town of Bieber, Polo decries the death of her cows and loss of other possessions as heavy rainfall forced them out for a third time. The family cannot afford shelter or firewood, and like most of people in the area, they now eat only once a day. Our home was hit by the floods before. So when this flood came, we left the home. We have a lot of challenges. We don't have a plastic sheet that can use as a canoe. We were displaced by the fighting and we fled, but we came back. 
scientists attribute the unusual rains to a recurring weather pattern that has been exacerbated by climate change. 12 months of cycling between flooding and violence have left communities in desperate need of food and water. A field coordinator for the aid group, Doctors Without Borders, says the town is also witnessing a spike in measles and malaria cases. Huge, huge rates of malaria positivity, uh, which we're treating at clinics and at a mobile clinic. We're also seeing uh, a measles uh, a rise or a spike in measles cases here. We're also very concerned about food insecurity. Twelve months of displacement has led to a lack or food shortage in the area. More than 120 people have died and some 860,000 houses have been destroyed in flooding in oil-rich country. Amid growing needs, inflation has surged, with prices of some locally produced supplies been increased by as much as 300 to 400 percent. Some 800,000 people have been affected by flooding and are in dire need of assistance. Paris Fashion Week has completed with collections excluding hope amid the coronavirus pandemic. Designer Stella's new collection was presented digitally with faith that lockdowns will one day be a thing of the past. More about her collection in this report. Hues of peach, pink and blue painted Stella McCartney's new collection presented digitally as part of Paris Fashion Week. The designer's new collection did not shy away from lockdown looks. Flip-flops featured exaggerated soles, leggings and jumpsuits, a balance of fashion and comfort. I definitely think there has to be optimism. I think people still have got to get dressed up. Jesus Christ, even if they're just at home or like, you've got to come out of this not just wearing sweatpants. And we will all come out of this. I'm already saying to my team, okay, where's our like, where's the celebration collection? Having the time during lockdown to explore fashion history, McCartney used contemporary classicism. It borrows sill huts from corsets and bustles, collapsing the structure, adding a softness with shapes and seaming that accentuate the female form. A lot of it is how I think you want to wear clothes and how you emotionally feel in them. So I came at it very much for that. So the, the jackets are much sort of smaller on top and then these sort of billowy pants, much sort of more generous and more kind of effortless. The collection once again reaffirmed the brand's focus on sustainability as 78% of cotton used is organic. The Lilo flip-flops are created with 50% recycled materials, while the Daisy Clock sandal made from gold stud hardware and wood is vegan and cruelty-free. More news coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Now in golf, Martin Laird and Patrick Cantlay are leading the tournament of Shriners Hospital for Children Open. Both hit six under par 65s at the third round in Las Vegas. Overnight, co-leader Laird was sensational off the tee, hitting all 14 fairways, nearly taking the lead. The former champion now sits 20 under par, 193 for the tournament and looks to claim his first PGA to a title since 2013. Laird's playing partner and 2017 champion Cantley eyes his third win on the PGA Tour. The low round of the day belonged to Matthew Wolf, who needed a birdie birdie finish to card a 59. Wolf is tied for third with fellow Americans Wyndham Clark, Brian Harmon, and Austin Cook. In football now, Germany beat host Ukraine 2 1 in their Nations League and counter, securing their first win in four matches. The victory is also Germany's first ever in this competition. Matthias Ginter put Germany ahead in the 20th minute after good work from Antonio Rodriguez. Leon Goretzka built on Germany's lead by heading in the second goal four minutes after restart. Roslin scored for Ukraine in the 77th minute, but the German side held on to one goal lead till the end. Germany's coach Joachim Leoe said the team's bench strength helped secure the win. Well, now let's have a look at the weather updates.
Well, that is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.